since the Industrial Revolution. Schools in America have followed a traditional model of education with long hours of lectures in a classroom. It's a structure that many believe is flawed, and there are better innovative pathways to preparing young people for the modern world. Longtime educator Bryce Carlisle spoke with me recently about why he left a prestigious school to promote a new kind of learning as co-founder of the Waterloo School in Austin, Texas. Well, welcome, Bryce Carlisle. Good to have you here. What has prompted uh, the start of a new school? What do you see going on in our education systems today? What we've seen is a hundred years of innovation in education. And so you could say that we're more educated than ever before, but we're also more anxious about education. And there's all sorts of pressure to get into college. Another trend that we're watching happen is young people seem to have a harder and harder time growing up and moving into the world and taking responsibility. They used to have the support of communities. They used to have the support of friends and parents' friends. And increasingly, that pressure is now on the schools. And so Waterloo is trying to enter into the conversation of incredible innovation that's happening at the forefront of change as we enter the, continue to go into the 21st economy and the, work, the workplace is changing. The needs for education are, are rapidly changing. So I noticed that you um, are really looking at mentorship yes. as being an important part of, of the high school. So talk about that a little bit. So one of our distinctive marks is that we wanna have mentorship woven through every part of the program and especially in uh, students doing internships. So rather than pulling kids away from the city, we wanna send ki kids into the city and teach them how to be value contributors. So that if, if a Waterloo student comes to be an intern, they'll have been coached and prepared through our leadership to come in and to actually serve the needs of a place where they're serving as an intern. And they'll get high school credit for that. We have partnerships with many local businesses in the city of Austin who have offered to pioneer this program with us. And we're really excited to continue to find new opportunities to do that with our students. So that's exciting. How will you be able to uniquely tailor that for each student? That's actually at the heart of the whole program, is we want to find the unique thumbprint of each student. So if you've got a student that's interested in computer programming, we want to tap into the network that we have in this amazing city full of innovators and find that network that allows a, a relationship to emerge there where that student could maybe find that internship. Um, if a student is super into history, we have a partnership with um, a living history organization here in Austin, and they can go and actually serve in the area that they're passionate about. And so that's, that's one of the things that we're really excited about is all parents and teachers dream of students finding their unique signature and the, the unique person that they are, having a chance to express that, not uh, outside of the school hours, but as, as part of the warp and woof of, of actual education. You know, it's interesting because historically, mentorship was the way that people learned to trade. That's right, yeah. A, it is, it's probably the most time-tested instrument for, for education. Um, standardized education, offering every single student the same thing on a fixed schedule with bells driving the six or seven classes through the day and then a hurried schedule off to sports or extracurriculars, that's actually really atypical. It's only been about 100 years that we've done that. Um, mentorship is a, is a thousands year old tradition and always at the heart of mentorship was this, was this question that has never gone away. Is how can we help young people transition through these crazy teenage years and become the flourishing young adult that they are intended to be? You're actually working with someone who can teach you something from the industry that you're interested in. A great mentor is this amazing balance of, hey, I'm just here to talk to you about how's your life going? Let's go have coffee. And let's talk about where you're going. You know, what, do you, what decisions are you making? How are you managing your schedule? 
And how's that working out for you? So tell me about city engagement. What does that mean? We want students to get out and engage the city of Boston and see museums, go to an internship, do a field trip, go and actually engage in city life instead of just always pulling away from the city in order to be in a classroom disconnected from it. So tell me about your schedule and how the day is planned. We will have three tri trimesters and students will take two classes at a time. And so for the first 12 weeks, they'll have a morning class and an afternoon class separated by lunch. We'll start at nine, end the day at, at three. And so students will have 20% more class time because they're not switching classes according to the bell schedule. They have one break in the day. And that schedule allows them to go deeper into their subjects and really get uh, and work on their projects. We're gonna be a project-based school so we needed to redesign the schedule from the ground up to create time and space for that. What is your research behind mm -hmm. only having two classes at a time? Because that sounds amazing to have two courses so they can go deeper. There is a group that does data-based uh, studies for independent schools. It's called ISM. The bottom line is <laughs> the worst schedule that you can have is a 55-minute period separated by a bell so you're cramming in incoherent classes one after another. It's the one that we all inherited from the factory model uh, that, that we got from World War I um, in that time period. But there has been a lot of innovation and the research that the ISM presents says the ideal schedule would be two classes at a time or at least a schedule that rotates a block schedule where you can get some deeper learning chunks woven into uh, shorter time periods. So we've taken that and said, well, let's do the entire schedule that way. Especially the learner. I can imagine that the learner really benefits from that. Absolutely. And that's the thing I think our team is most excited about when we think of the project-based learning that we're doing. These students are going to do a class, say it's called the rise and fall of civilizations. That's history. You're going to have some book knowledge. You're definitely going to be writing some papers and presenting. But if a student wanted to do a web page and uh, do some media and produce some videos on a focused area and, and create a, a project that would actually tell the world about the fall of the Incan civilization, for example, and focus their research in a creative way, they can work on that project and our schedule allows them the time and space to do that. And so what we're trying to do is create a space for students to tap into their passion. It's in the context of the rise and fall of civilizations, but it's something that they're really interested in and that they get to express their creativity and offer something of value to the public. Instead of hiding all that away behind a grade book mm -hmm. and, and, and having the, the terminus be a grade that a teacher assigns, why not, why not trust students to actually be capable of using their creativity and their unique thumbprint and their signature gifts to actually go find a way of contributing value? It's the difference between seeing what the learner has taken from what you've presented as material, taking it further into, into who they are. That's right. And as a teacher, it's so easy to fall into false assessments. Well, I asked it on the, on the test and you didn't answer. Well, maybe your test was poorly designed. Right. So is the traditional educational model that we follow in the United States, is that um, really preparing young people for today's world? It's not. And everybody knows if you talk to teachers and you ask them, what should we really be doing with our young people and what should we not be doing? In two minutes, you will start to feel their pain. This is a widespread uh, sense, but it's really hard to turn a really big ship. They don't turn on a dime. And there are a lot of conversations that are beginning to emerge. There's a, a charter school in San Diego called High Tech High. And they got to build their curriculum and instruction from the ground up, asking the question, what would it look like if you trusted teachers and if you trusted students to do projects? 
And to, to have that be the fundamental basis on which the learning is, all the learning happens. The amazing creativity. I've got to recommend that the viewers watch the movie Most Likely to Succeed. And they'll meet amazing teachers and amazing students of students who are finding their voice. And they feature this young girl who is quiet. She's a freshman, I believe. And you think there's no way that this, this girl is going to become a leader in the context of, of doing a stage production. Well, that's exactly what she does because that's her project. And it just shows what can happen when you invite students into their, you call them out to a project that will, that will draw from them a, ch a challenge and they'll have to face it with courage and they'll have to stretch into it and learn the leadership that they actually have within them. It's an amazing movie. And, and to watch this, these teachers walk through the challenges of doing projects, it's so inspiring to see what can happen if we make projects. And this is the kind of innovation that will allow students uh, to, to prepare better for a 21st century economy that's changing so fast. So quickly. What do the parents think of this? Families that are stepping outside of the normal factory model of traditional education um, have found a lot of resonance. It is a steep upward climb and it's, it's taking time to, b to build the momentum that we, we want to see. But we really believe that there are some great conversations that are happening nationwide and Waterloo's position in Austin to bring that to the families here uh, to, serve, to serve these kids' needs. What are the options for, let's say, how this can be transferred into a public education area or charter schools? I think an excellent thing that all parents could look into is a mentorship. It, it, mentoring is something that's actually pretty low, low overhead, and it needs to be done wisely. I, th I, I think it's wise for there to be uh, mentorships that meet in groups of three and not one-on-one -on -one and same gender. But there are things like that where mentorship can be, um, can be wo woven into the normal co course of a public school education and can make an enormous difference in a young person's life. Being involved in more communities than just the school community. Actually volunteering. There are all sorts of opportunities to serve the needs of elderly, to read to them, to do art projects together in retirement homes. These are incredible opportunities and they really do leave a, a, a legacy of great memory and, um, and knowing that you've been involved in something that's important, that's out in the public, that's bigger than just yourself. So much of this, the way we're doing education makes it seem like it's all about teens getting to create their, their world of um, college acceptance and, and having a path that's, that's uh, laid out for them to be successful. But what they really need is to, is to engage and serve other people and actually be involved in meaningful work. When I was in education, one of the shifts that I saw early on was when it, certification requirements changed. Mm -hmm. And we lost engineers who were coming in and teaching mm -hmm. in the high schools. We lost uh, individuals who had, been, had their careers in a field who wanted to come teach not be able to darken the doors of a public school because they were not a certified teacher. They have such amazing things to share. And you think about what you learn on the job. It's not academic, but it's practical. And it's, that's where the real learning for the rest of life happens. Where did we get this crazy idea that you pull away from the kinds of learning, the kinds of uh, adaptive learning that you have to do in any career and serving people's real needs and, and making this system where it's all grade based and age level sorted and, and course distinguished, it's, it's, it feels like a factory <laughs> and that's, that's where it comes from. But where's the application? Where's the concrete task? that needs that information in order to achieve a goal. That should be the whole picture. So in regard to Waterloo, what do you hope your impact will be? Our deep dream is to see individual students growing up and flourishing and becoming mature, responsible, creative, 
people who serve real needs and love deeply and richly and learn. And we hope to be a part of a conversation of educators, good people all over this country in all sorts of schools who are pioneering and creating creative approaches to solve a really big, complicated problem that we're all wrestling with in education. Waterloo is actually the original name of the town of Austin. We love the stories of those pioneers, and we're looking to forge ahead with a new model of, of a high school. And um, we don't just want to make a new school, we want to make a new, a new kind of school. Well, thank you. Thank you for being here, and I wish Waterloo the best. Thank you, Nelda.